I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming. My name is Alice Smith, and I'm the lead for National Voter Corps. National Voter Corps is an organization which you'll hear more about after our speaker, because we want to give the maximum time to Kathleen Unger. Kathleen Unger is um, described as of counsel at Freeman, Freeman, and Shirley. A uh, smiley, sorry. Um, she was selected for inclusion in the prestigious peer-reviewed, both 2016 and 2017 editions of the best lawyers in America. I have never achieved that. Uh, previously, Kathleen was in-house counsel and vice president at MCA Universal Studios, uh, which is now NBC uh, Universal. For 15 years, in 2007, she co-founded and edited electionspreparedness.com. Um, Kathleen serves on the board of directors of the Philadelphia Eagles Charitable Foundation. Uh, formerly, she served as managing director and CEO of Starbright Foundation with Steven uh, Spielberg as chairman and as member of the board of directors of both the Scott Newman Foundation and Center, including the president with Paul Newman as chairman. Um, for the KCRW Foundation, which you probably all know about, and the Valley Community Clinic, including as Vice Chairman, Kathleen holds a BS degree, a JD, an MBA from UCLA's Anderson Graduation Graduate School of Management, and a mediation certification from a program at Harvard Law School. Also with her tonight, which we're very pleased, um, I'd like to in introduce her, her staff person, whose name is Le Leanna Reynolds-Levy, correct? Leanna Le Le Levy. Levy, sorry. Um, <laughs> she has a PhD, has been engaged for nearly two de decades in democracy promotion and citizen participation. She lives in Alameda, so she's going to be very close at hand, we're pleased to say. Um, she has extensive experience in building collaborative partnerships with grassroots organizations, along with managing communication campaigns and network knowledge sharing initiatives. And she's been with Partners for Dem Democratic Change for 10 years before that. And she's very skilled in technology. So we're very pleased tonight to introduce um, uh, Kathleen Unger. But before she comes, please hold your questions until she's finished so that she will no doubt answer the question you were first thinking of, and you can build on your question from then. And uh, so out of respect for the time that we have, I would appreciate your doing that. And we will only take questions using the microphone so everyone can hear the question. Thank you very much. Let's give a warm welcome to Kathleen. Thank you. Thank you to Lisa Frito and to Alice Smith and Amy Layden and all the members of the National Voter Corps Steering Committee for their leadership in protecting the right to vote uh, and for their thoughtful invitation for me to join you this evening. I'm wholeheartedly appreciative of your, of your warm welcome. Uh, the right to vote is the civil rights issue of our time. Without protecting the right to vote, we tr cannot truly call our country a democracy. Uh, and can you hear? Am I so? Do I need? Excuse me. Can you use my phone? Am I supposed to use this? It's not on. Oh. All right. Thank you. What What do I do? Here. Here we are. Can you hear? Yes. Ah. Sorry. Wow. Okay. So. Uh, I would, as I was saying, that uh, the right to vote is the civil rights issue of our time. Without protecting the right to vote, uh, really, uh, we cannot truly call our country a democracy. And vote writers is where uh, rubber meets the road, so that voters have a valid ID and the confidence that their ID will produce a seamless voting experience. So what are vote writers and voter ID all about? The first three words of the Constitution, we the people, mean that the right to vote is fundamental uh, to both our Constitution and to our entire system of government. Of course, fundamental to our nation's founding, the Declaration of Independence, is that all men are created equal. 
well, millions of citizens do not have an acceptable form of voter ID in the 32 states with these laws currently in force, including uh, Arkansas uh, with a much more uh, onerous law that just became, uh, that was just uh, passed into law, was just signed and will go into effect in about four months. Plus, West Virginia's law, which is in the midst of being revised, will go into effect next year or 2019. So that's 33 states, and there are an additional 18 states that are considering new or even more restrictive voter ID legislation. Alabama, Arizona, Georgia, and Kansas already have voter registration laws that require documentary proof of citizenship. Uh, and similar legislation is being pursued in Maryland, Texas, and Virginia. Importantly, many at-risk voters in these states don't realize it's just not enough to register to vote. You need a qualifying ID. Before 2006, no state required photo identification to vote. The rate at which states have adopted new and tougher voter ID requirements accelerated with the 2008 election and was then spurred by the demise of mandated federal oversight when the Supreme Court got it the most effective feature of the Voting Rights Act. Vote Riders, a five-year-old, 501c3, nonpartisan nonprofit, is the leading organization that deals exclusively with voter ID. We inform and help citizens in securing their ID, and we uh, inspire and support organizations, local volunteers, and, um, and, and communities to sustain voter education and assistance efforts. We concentrate on obtaining the documents required under each state's voter ID law, especially uh, a certified copy of a birth certificate um, and legal documents approving any name changes, all of which can be complicated, uh, relatively or very expensive, and time consuming. So who's impacted? Primarily those who don't have a current driver's license in their state. The following numbers of voting age Americans who don't have current, unexpired, government-issued photo identification came from a 2006 study by the Brennan Center of Justice, uh, for Justice at NYU Law School. So these numbers are clearly higher now, that was 11 years ago, Plus, we know from expert testimony in various trials that hundreds of thousands of voters lack a voter ID in each state. So as many as 11% of voting age American citizens, nearly 27.5 million individuals as of the July 1, 2016 census, do not have current unexpired government-issued photo identification with their current name and address, including, as of 2015, 18% uh, or 8 and 2 thirds uh, uh, American, uh, 8 and 2 thirds million American citizens age 65 and above. 25% uh, or more than 8 million African Americans, 18% or 5.2, uh, 5 5.62 uh, million citizens age 18 to 24. And as of last September, over 11 million uh, who earn less than 30,000 a year. Another key group of those significantly impacted by voter ID laws are the 53 million uh, uh, adults with disabilities. Obviously, a lot of those folks are not driving. And since a number of states require an exact match between the name on your voter ID and the name in which you're registered to vote, uh, women especially can run into problems in the, in the polling place. Just remember that the 2000 election was based on only 537 votes as the margin of victory. I, sorry, okay. <laughs> uh, I've learned that voter ID can be summed up in one word, confusion. And there are three layers of confusion. The first layer is that there is pervasive confusion in every single state because people have been hearing about voter ID laws since really early 2011, and so they're confused, do they need an ID, what kind of ID, and importantly, poll workers are confused because they ask uh, voters, 
uh, for their voter ID, including in California and the 17 other states and D.C. where there is no state voter ID law. The second layer of confusion uh, is, the, is that many, if not most people, don't really understand that voter ID is, is different from and in addition to voter registration. I, I mentioned this earlier. They, they hear the words voter ID, but they're thinking voter registration. And in fact, the media are confused. I find it all the time that, that something's about voter ID and the headline, whatever, it's all about voter registration. The third layer of this confusion cake is actually in two parts. The first part is, you know, those of us who are aware of the fact that there are people who don't have the requisite ID to vote, uh, uh, we know that, for instance, uh, it was found in the, by, in the courts that 608,000 uh, uh, registered Texas voters do not have uh, a valid Texas voter ID. Uh, we know uh, through court testimony and expert testimony in, in Wisconsin uh, that over 300,000 registered voters, 9% of registered voters in Wisconsin don't have ID, okay? They don't have the ID to vote. Um, but the second half of this third layer is something we discovered on the ground in Texas in 2014 uh, and that was then corroborated by a study done by Rice University and the University of Houston, uh, that, where they had done a study of the November 2014 election uh, uh, of the most congre uh, competitive congressional district. And they found, in essence, that a net 9% of registered voters were so confused and intimidated by the voter ID law that they didn't vote even though they had a valid ID, okay? So now if you extrapolate that over to Wisconsin, uh, you've got 9% registered voters without a valid ID, and then you've got an additional 9% of registered voters who are confused, and these laws are truly intimidating, and they don't vote. 18%, that's almost 604,000 registered voters in Wisconsin alone. An opinion poll published six weeks before Wisconsin's presidential election last year found that 16% of all re eligible voters either thought erroneously there was no ID requirement or they weren't certain. Okay, let's talk about myths versus facts. Reputable study after study has shown that in-person voter fraud, which is what voter ID is allegedly designed to prevent, is vanishingly rare. Among the best is a comprehensive investigation of voter, impersonal, voter impersonation allegations from 2000 to 2014. Law professor, voting expert, and the recent deputy assistant attorney general uh, in the US Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, Justin Levitt, found 31 credible incidents of voter impersonation in all elections, general, primary, special, and municipal. And likely, some of those were as a result of clerical errors. In general and primary elections alone, more than one billion votes were cast in that 14-year time period. So you have 31 credible allegations out of over, over a billion votes cast. Another myth that is that you should just use the ID to vote that you use to function in modern life. Well, what about those with out-of-state licenses who can get on an airplane but can't use them to vote in several states like Wisconsin? What about your student ID? Well, it's not valid at all in Arizona, and it's not if it's from an Indiana private institution. Importantly, other states' college IDs may not be voter ID compliant. For example, only three out of Wisconsin's 13 four-year four colleges issue IDs that meet that state's voter ID requirements. Here's another myth. You need a government-issued photo ID to fly. Now, of course, voting, again, is fundamental to our constitutional democracy, and getting on an airplane is not. But, actually, for years, the TSA and its predecessors have consistently maintained a policy 
that accommodates those without a government issued photo ID. So how much of a difference do voter ID laws make? Citizens in 15 states last year faced new voting restrictions for the first time in a presidential election. According to the Government Accountability Office, which has studied the, the question in Kansas and Tennessee, ID laws can suppress 3% of the vote, which can translate into tens of thousands of votes lost in a single state. Some unusually frank Republican officials have even cited this figure as their goal. A 3% shift would have overturned Barack Obama's uh, victories in North Carolina and Indiana in 2008 and would have come close to threatening his re-election in 2012. So what is vote writers doing about all this? Understanding the rules about voter registration, voter ID, and voting is not a partisan issue, it's an American issue. For those who live in non-voterized D states like California, we are encouraging supporters to inform your friends and neighbors to speak to, to distribute vote writers, California voter ID information cards. We've got examples of the Virginia card on the table out there, which are available in English and in Spanish, and to display flyers at your local schools, churches, and other places of worship, uh, other civic and community organizations, to convey that registered voters do not need to show additional ID at the polls unless they are first-time voters in their county. We hope you may even write a, an op-ed for your local or, or regional or even statewide paper. We like uh, to make sure you and your friends stay current with the latest developments in voter ID by signing up at votewriters.org, that's V-O-T-E-R-I-D-E-R-S.org, for our email updates following vote writers on Twitter and, and Facebook, and sharing this information with your online and offline social networks in every state. Uh, be happy to discuss more that with you. Our outreach and assistance include our national toll-free voter ID hotline, 844-338-8743, which includes local area codes in Wisconsin and soon in Virginia. We've learned that good voter ID outreach programs involve local knowledge and local groundwork which is why we partner with organizations that have long-standing relationships of trust in their community in order to reach voters. Finding and assisting people who need to secure ID to vote is challenging. The people most at risk of not being able to secure their ID are oftentimes really difficult to reach. It's the hardest part of this whole thing is finding those who need the help. It can take weeks, even months, of follow-up work to help a single voter obtain his or her ID, his or her ID. Plus, voters, voter ID laws are complex and vary enormously from state to state. In our experience, the most effective way to organize to assist voters is to support local voter ID coalitions that include on-the-ground organizations, local election, and government <laughs> officials, community institutions, and businesses like taxi and other transportation companies. In 2017, it's essential that we expand our network of partner organizations and support their voter ID coalitions. Vote writers, volunteers can help by introducing us to potential partners in our current uh, priority voter ID states. Alabama, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Indiana, Kansas, Missouri, North Dakota, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, and Wisconsin. We're focusing especially on Virginia, which is the only state that has, it's the only voter ID state with statewide elections this year. Of course, that list will lengthen as the number of states requiring strict voter ID grows, and that will likely narrow next year based on competitive races that raise voter interest. So if you or any of your contacts have connections with local organizations in these states that might be interested in partnering with vote writers, we'd be thrilled to know about that. 
Collaboration can be as simple as using boat riders' free tools and resources to communicate each state's voter ID information to their constituents through in-person outreach, their websites, social media, e-blasts, announcements, flyers, and media interviews. Letting people know that if they have voter ID questions or need help, Boat Riders offers free assistance uh, via boatriders.org, info at boatriders.org, and our national uh, hotlines. Um, distributing that state's voter ID information wallet cards, which we have for each of the 50 states and D.C., again in English and in Spanish, uh, and which we are continuing to update based on court rulings and legislation. Helping to organize and participate in Voter ID Month, Voter ID Week, Voter ID Day, for which we are uh, finalizing a toolkit, and conducting voter ID clinics. Importantly, we'd love for you to organize a fundraising drive to adopt a voter ID coalition in a priority state like Virginia. These local coalitions need support to offer a full range of voter ID services. Every dollar makes a difference. Boat riders will pair your fundraising network with a specific uh, state coalition so you can see exactly where your tax deductible dollars are going. I just want to circle back briefly to boat riders' voter ID information wallet cards. Each state's card highlights the specific IDs that are valid, including relevant restrictions like an expiration date. They're unique and an extraordinarily valuable resource because they're precisely accurate and clear for all those millions of voters who lack a valid ID or who need confidence that their ID is acceptable. Perhaps most important of all, these wallet cards are crucial as backup in the polling place in the case it, when you're faced with a misinformed coworker. Vote Writers Voter ID Info Cards are extremely useful to those on the front lines of voter registration and get out the vote efforts who need to remind everyone about voter ID requirements in their respective states and refer voters to us to answer their questions and to help them if needed. For instance, last year, uh, the National Voter Registration Day, which is huge, spread the word about our voter, uh, about our wallet cards so that there are 4,000 participating organizations engaged in voter registration drives were able to distribute the cards. Indeed, we printed and shipped over 500,000 cards last fall, including 400,000 to the Campus Election Engagement Project at 167 colleges and universities in 15 states. I can't tell you how much we appreciate your interest and look forward to hearing and, and learning of any ideas you may have uh, again, please know your tax-deductible donation to vote writers will help us to print and ship voter ID information wallet cards to pay stipends to local nonprofits qualified staff starting in Virginia who will organize and coordinate their community's voter ID coalition to pay for low-income voters required voter ID uh, documents and transportation to the DMV along with other effective efforts. Now is the time to foster and support voter ID coalitions. Importantly, we must overcome voters' desire to procrastinate to ensure that their vote will count. So I'm happy to entertain any questions you may have. I kind of raced through a lot of information. Um, and uh, uh, yes. Well, is there, I'll just take the privilege of the first question. Is there any effort to get to every state university where uh, they didn't have the appropriate state ID for that state university, but it could be appropriate to get them to comply when they issue their student IDs? So, um, some, uh, okay, okay. So the question was, uh, uh, might there be a way to get colleges and universities to issue voter ID compliant student ID cards in their state? So uh, some are more amenable to doing that than others. So for instance, uh, again, because we just you know had a team on the ground in 2015, 2016 in Wisconsin, so it's very much top of mind. 
uh, University of Wisconsin uh, at Madison <clears throat> refused time and time again to make their student ID, uh, voter ID compliant. Uh, this is with 14,000 out-of-state students, plus that assumes that the students who live in Wisconsin have, you know, an ID, have a driver's license. That's the primary uh, type of ID. They, they uh, basically, they said it was too expensive. So, um, <clears throat> uh, what, what we would like to see would be when a student is registering, okay, and they're getting all this documentation uh, to, to not only have a voter ID compliant student ID card, but something that explains, okay, this is, so for again, coming back to Wisconsin, not only do you need the voter ID, you know, a, a compliant student ID, but you also need separately to bring proof of enrollment. So, uh, <clears throat> this, is, this is just an example of what, what goes on. I'll bring the mic to... Uh, by the way, while, while Lane is going over there, uh, you, I don't know if you're aware of this, but, but studies have shown that uh, young people increasingly are not getting a driver's license. They're not driving. Okay, and then you look at everywhere you look, it's about the, you know, the driverless autos and this and that, and uh, there's, where are these IDs going to come from? That, you know, that what is going to be the driver uh, for, for people, as, pardon me the pun, to, uh, to uh, get a, a state non-driver, you know, non-driver's ID, which is also acceptable in all these states. Sorry. So what are some examples of organizations that you partner with? I think I've heard taxis and churches, um, universities. What, what else? What else have you found to be useful? Okay, so um, uh, primarily organizations that interface with at-risk voters. So organizations that deal with older uh, adults, okay, who are no longer driving, they let their driver's license expire. Young adults, so uh, across the board, people with low income. So anything from food pantries, job centers, to uh, <clears throat> shelters, to, um, uh, you know, uh, there are, there are some places that will get people a legal ID. They don't focus on voting, but usually in one, there's at least one in a in a in an urban center where, and it's usually affiliated with a church. Um, uh, civil rights organizations, um, uh, community organizations, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Mi Familia Vota. Uh, uh, Maldef, uh, you know, uh, organizations that interface with uh, uh, voters of color and uh, disability rights organizations um, and, uh, you know, the League of Women Voters in certain uh, communities like in Kansas and um, so, okay. I'm concerned about your reliance on printed material, anecdotal reports from the 2016 Texas situation where court rulings came rather quickly and changed situations. Polling officials talked about their training and printed materials didn't reflect the court rulings and there was quite a bit of chaos. If your strategy relies also on printed material, is there any option to go to electronic media? So we rely on, uh, especially on the ground organizations and furnishing them with, with, with resources and tools that, that they can use. So um, yes, we have printed material, but we have uh, an extensive information on our website and we're also very responsive to voters <clears throat> and organizations who are contacting us all the time through our hotline 
uh, and through our website and through email. And uh, uh, you know, if we had the the uh, the financial wherewithal, uh, we would be expanding uh, more into uh, you know radio and and television to get folks who. Uh, aren't online, which obviously, uh, especially when you're talking about across the board people with low income uh, and and oftentimes older voters, that's an issue. So yes. Is the U.S. passport acceptable in all these states? Interestingly, no. Okay? Wow. What? Well, okay. Hold on. Okay. So anyway, I'll just continue to explain. So, uh, you know, people tend to focus on Texas as being the most onerous voter ID state. It's actually North Dakota. North Dakota, it's... It's a driver's license, it's a non-driver's license uh, uh, ID, and a tribal card, okay? Only if you are a North Dakota resident who is temporarily living outside the country, including military, can you use a passport or a military card. Okay, so... Uh, no, Every, the only two types of ID that are common to all of them are a, uh, a current driver's license of that state and a current non-driver's ID uh, of, in, in that state. That's because your passport doesn't prove you wouldn't that so. You know, um, I want to know who is setting these regulations in the state. Is it the governor or is it the secretary of state? Who influences, who does this? Well, it's, it's the legislature who passed the laws and then the governor who signs. And so um, uh, there, uh, frankly, uh, and this is just a fact, uh, except for Rhode Island, uh, all of these uh, stri stringent voter ID laws have been enacted in states with either uh, uh, Republicans in the majority in both chambers, both houses of their legislature, uh, with a um, with a Republican governor signing, or uh, where you've got a supermajority of Republicans in the legislature who can overcome, uh, override the veto of the Democratic Party. So if you were to change that mix, know. could they change the law? Well, of course. Okay. Yes. So the, the question was if you changed the mix of, 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 of those who are uh, passing and signing laws, would that change the law? Yes. Although, they sadly are being very smart these days, and and uh, few states are increasingly uh, uh, passing and then putting out to voters. Voters are passing a, a constitutional amendment. Okay, wow. so it's this is a big deal. Yes. Uh, thank you for coming with us tonight. And yeah. I did want to ask, um, relative, I got here a few minutes late, uh, primarily due to traffic, and if you've already given an overview, I'm very interested in learning in what specific problems you, your organization is trying to solve. I'm, I'm aware of many problems in this area, but I'm wondering what it is your organization is specifically championing and focusing on. And, and then a second question, um, we're all aware of the Russian interference, and uh, hopefully that will get independently investigated in a bipartisan, objective way, which remains to be seen. 
But I believe from a lot of articles I read in the months leading up to the election and in the months after, and not from alternative news organizations or fake news organizations, very mainstream organizations, very reputable organizations, uh, there were things that were done in this area in the 2016 election. Uh, reducing the precincts open for early voting and people had massive lines that they encountered in some geographies. Mm -hmm. um, there were also uh, roles that were created by Republican, uh, I think, state um, secretaries of state to kind of disenfranchise people with duplicate middle names. Um, I heard of other actions as well. Do, does your organization or has any organization looked into was that a factor in that disenfranchisement in the out, possible factor in the outcome of the election? Are, have you heard anything about that? Are you aware of that? So to respond to your first question, uh, we focus on educating the public about voter ID, uh, uh, what's needed, if anything, okay, and to make sure that they know where to to come to us if they have any questions uh, uh, or that they need help. So one is information. We've learned that, uh, I mentioned this earlier, no state has done an adequate job, and I am 1,000% convinced no state will do an adequate job of informing and educating their public uh, about what's required with voter ID. So uh, we're thoroughly convinced that that education has to happen through on the ground organizations. Again, these organizations that have a relationship of trust with their constituents, their members, their customers, so as to get the word out that way. So one is that information education part, and the other we focus on is the actual assistance anybody who's got a question or, or, or you know, who needs help. Most of the time, we're actually able to help them over the phone and, and online. But if, if an individual needs more help, then we send somebody, uh, then, we, then we connect them with, with an on-the-ground organization and or a lawyer. I, I just want to take a moment and tell you about a case study, because I think you will find this interesting speaking. So this is in, in, in Wisconsin. A U.S. Marine Corps veteran, Dennis Hatton, was born in Arkansas in the early 60s. He moved to Illinois and then Wisconsin to care for his ailing mother, then his father, then his grandmother. He was living at a shelter for homeless veterans when he attended a vote writer's presentation about voter ID requirements. Discovering that a Wisconsin voter ID would require his obtaining his long lost birth certificate, Dennis worked with Vote Writers Wisconsin statewide coordinator and a volunteer attorney. The next six months was consumed with investigation and follow up, including multiple trips to government agencies. We eventually found Dennis's birth certificate, birth certificate but only after discovering that the midwife who attended his birth had misspelled Dennis's name on the document. Fortunately, that misspelled name was corroborated by his original social security application. If it hadn't been, he, he would not have been able to get a, you know, a valid birth certificate and wouldn't have been able to vote. So Dennis finally received his ID to vote just in time for the election. How many people would be able to undertake that kind of an effort in order to vote? Uh, more importantly, in a democracy, should the basic and sacred right to vote be available only to those who have easy access to documentation or the resources to track down and pay for documents buried in our Byzantine county-by-county -county system of vital records? Of course, the fact that the DMV and poll workers are not consistently and well-trained is a huge challenge to the proper implementation of these laws. To, uh, to your second uh, question, uh, they, uh, vote writers focuses like a laser on voter ID. Uh, again, we're essentially the only organization to do so. We're of service to everyone. Uh, so there are 
uh, uh, numerous organizations that are focusing on other aspects of um, voting restrictions and and bringing lawsuits. Thank you for your work on educating uh, the public, the citizens on voter ID and getting the word out. Uh, another question I have in terms, this is a poll tax in another guise, mm -hmm. and this is unconstitutional and un illegal. <laughs> what efforts are occurring with ACLU or other organizations with are filing legal challenges in these various states? So, uh, oh, this sorry. is unconstitutional. Right. Thank you. So, so uh, to, uh, frankly, I completely agree with you, uh, because while they s skate around it by making the voter ID itself free, it's not free to get these underlying documents to get your free voter ID. Um, I'm pretty sure it was in Arizona where there was a case that uh, uh, was that, that one of the uh, questions or issues, and there could have been a couple of cases where uh, a poll tax was, you know, among the allegations, and it hasn't gotten anywhere, at least up to the level of the federal appellate courts. It's not, it's, the issue has not gone to the U.S. Supreme Court, but it never made it past the, the federal appellate level. So, uh, I, and I know uh, Alice Smith of uh, National Voter Corps and, and uh, the steering committee are uh, giving a serious consideration to um, how to pursue this. And I just say, more power to you, please. Question is, uh, what differences might there be between the requirements for identification when you're registering to vote versus voter ID? Um, and I should mention that while North Dakota it has the most draconian voter ID law, um, uh, it's the only state in the union where there's no requirement to register to vote. So, uh, uh, so. Uh, as I mentioned, there are f four states, at least uh, 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 Kansas, Alabama, Georgia, and Arizona, that require documentary proof of citizenship to register to vote. Uh, and the Secretary of State of Kansas, Chris Kobach, is, is absolutely the leader, bar none, of the hysteria around uh, non-citizens voting and doing whatever he possibly can to uh, to uh, encourage states to uh, restrict uh, voting in the various ways. Um, and there are another three states that are considering uh, these laws. A, a, a concern is that uh, that the uh, potentially the Trump administration uh, will either uh, try to, or I think it could be both, uh, to try to enact a national voter ID requirement. Uh, and another concern is that the uh, national voter, uh, uh, what it's known as the Motor Voter Law, the National Voter Registration Act. Um, <clears throat> Uh, that they will try to to uh, get Congress to to restrict that um, so that uh, uh, so that the federal voter registration form on which one need only attest to one's citizenship uh, would 
uh, allow states with their own uh, voter registration restrictions to um, apply to those who use a, a federal voter registration form. The third row up there was the next question you're going to ask. Do you want to say anything about the relative uh, problems that are, uh, I think, very tightly related to this, which is uh, anything that we can do about systematic redistricting? And uh, also the lack of available, uh, I would say, reliable voting machines, that the budget for buying voting machines, especially in poorer districts, is insufficient to keep them up to date. So they're old, they don't work very well, they don't have enough of them, so there aren't enough locations, so people have to travel more to get to them. And also uh, just about the, the chronic underrepresentation of uh, people who live in large concentrations. So, you know, we, we just simply don't get as many representatives in. So, I mean, I, are there things we can do about this? Because this is all part of a bigger picture of problems that seem to be stacked right. against one side. Right. I, I, I will say that uh, one of the methods, to my madness, was of, 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 of focusing on, you know, and founding vote writers is that, A, I was outraged that people are losing the right to vote. Uh, I felt all the way along, who knows if, when, and to what extent any of these laws will be overturned or weakened. Um, and what I frankly particularly like about what we're doing is that we're not giving our power to someone else. We're not, we're not at the mercy of the courts, and we're not at the mercy of the legislature. We're saying, okay, this is your law, got it, now let's do whatever we can to make sure that that eligible voters in your state are, are going to have the ID so that they can vote. So that's, that's our approach. Um, Lena, okay, right. here, I'll, forgive me, I'll, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for your work. Do you have any reason to believe that uh, the trend we're seeing in the increasingly restrictive laws is going to change? And do you believe it's possible to keep up with the increasing restrictions with the voter ID efforts of your organization? Thank you. So the question is, uh, uh, do, 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 do we think that there, that this trend with these voter right, restrictive voter ID laws, are, are they going to become more restrictive? Are there going to be more states that require restrictive voter ID laws? The answer is yes to both. There are uh, uh, currently 18 states that are considering uh, new voter ID laws um, uh, that's in, believe it or not, California, Illinois, Iowa, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, uh, Nebraska, Nevada, New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. And then where they're considering more restrictive legislation, Indiana, Missouri, uh, even more than they have, uh, Montana, New Hampshire, North Dakota, Oklahoma, and Virginia. So, yes. Yes. Uh, what you're hearing, I think, is a little frustration because in this area, it's hard for us to feel like we have much of an impact right. in these other places. So, yeah. is there other than writing a check to you, is there an action item that we could take to actually have a practical impact in some of these issues in other areas? So, what what we recommend is is um, to think in terms of your own networks in these states that have voter ID laws, okay? Number one, if there's by some chance you have, you know someone who's, who's involved in an organization in that state, if you could connect us with them, okay? So uh, we can be, hopefully collaborate you know with them uh, give them information and and see if they want to uh, have their volunteers be more uh, active um, and 
then uh, 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 sending information to your the people you know in these states about voter ID, and it can be as uh, you know, <clears throat> and to try to get them to in turn to take a sense of of you know if responsibility and outreach uh, for this issue in their community, so that uh, <clears throat> you can refer to. We have lots of information uh, at votewriters.org that you can refer to. You can always get in touch with us, and we can try to help you. Uh, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, c create a, a a letter or something rather that you can email to or to, to, to people, or that you can use talking points uh, to the people in in uh, in those states. So it's really it's education and it's assistance, and so this to bring to people's attention in these other states that they um, that people are confused. And, and so to make sure that they know, you know, do they have the right ID and do they, uh, do they have any questions and, you know, send them our way. Uh, uh, we, uh, and to encourage them to, you know, uh, to uh, want to be active in their communities to educate people and to, you know, again, we have uh, various programs that they could that they could enact themselves. So it's really through your networks. Okay. Yes. Um, do you have any information on follow up of the people that you help? How much turnout you're actually getting? I mean, I'm assuming people who go through this really want to vote, but do you have any way of knowing if they do? Uh, we only. So the question is, do we have any uh, data on on uh, whether the people we help actually vote? And we're we're only aware anecdotally of <coughs> those who vote when uh, you know we're, they they let us know or we're you know there because uh, <clears throat> it's all happening at the same time. They're they okay. They've gone to the you know you've gone with them to the DMV and they got their ID or they got a receipt that's going to. You know, function as an ID for for voting, and and now you're taking them to uh, the, you know the polling place, and so you see them vote and whatever. But no, no, we don't. Yes, Lena. Uh, just recently, uh, one of our partner organizations in Texas, Me Familia Vota Texas, they gave us some really interesting data. They had six. Majority Latino precincts in you know in, uh, in Harris County in, uh, in northern North Houston. Um, they canvassed the neighborhoods there with with volunteers, with voter ID, including voter ID information, um, our cards, cards. Um, in English and Spanish, and the increase the countywide voter turnout went down one percent. So it's like sixty one to sixty percent in those six precincts. Voter turnout went up nine, eight percent. Eight percent. On average, a few little bit. So at least, so that I mean, we don't know how many of those people use voter ID information, but at least we know that 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 our information was part of what was being given out to voters, and they showed up to the polls. One day. Right? Yes, ma'am. Yes. That California is one of the 19 states listed here. Can you explain what is what, what's going on in California currently, and if we should be doing something? Yeah, no, it, I, I don't think it's it's uh, so uh, it's I, I believe a, um, a a Republican legislator who introduced a bill to, for a uh, voter ID law, and so um, uh, but. Uh, there are a lot of things that need attention in this world, and I feel very confident that's not one of them. <laughs> no, I really, I really don't think so. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. So I, I guess implicitly, I think I suspect many of us in the room are thinking that the best 
voter uh, ID system is the one we have in California. Uh, but I'm interested in your opinion as to is there something better than that? And the second uh, related question is, is there any form of voter ID which is desirable um, to, you know, in terms of uh, voting? Okay, so uh, the question is: um, is is there a uh, is there a, a desirable form of voter ID, and and how does California stack up in that regard? Well, so again, California, there's no state voter ID law, and uh, you know, frankly, let's let's all step back here until um, you know the last. Uh, I think it was somewhere in the 50s that some states started to have, uh, you know, voter ID law, but it was very, it was just you could request it, it was not required, and then in, you know, uh, 2005, 2006, when this was enacted, these requirements started to come in place, and, and they took off, especially after the uh, 2008 election of uh, Barack Obama. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, so, he, and here's, here's the, the, those behind uh, voter ID laws have done a terrific job of, of making it now, uh, the polls show that somewhere between three quarters and, and, and 80% of the American public think that voter ID is a good idea. Their attitude, of course, is, well, if you need an ID to get on an airplane or you need an ID to, to buy liquor, well, why, why wouldn't, of all things, you need an ID to vote? It's a very simplistic uh, uh, approach, uh, let alone the fact that none of those things are, are, are fundamental to our Constitution and, and our system of government. Um, the problem that, uh, that with requiring, frankly, uh, any kind of ID is that it's uh, at best confusing. Um, first of all, you know, a, a lot of states will say, okay, well, just bring a copy of a recent utility bill or um, uh, you know, a bank statement or a government check or something like that. There are millions of people that don't have any of those things in their name. All right. Now, what about where what's being contemplated in Iowa, where they're going to, if this passes, they're going to mail uh, an ID, non-photo ID. They're going to mail an ID to people. Well, what happens if you lose your ID, and uh, what? And then, and then you, you, it just it creates all these complications. There are now. Then you go to the polls, and I can't remember because there's so many states, there's so many laws. But <laughs> let's say you have to swear uh, that you you swear into your identity, and that you don't have one of the valid IDs. Okay, well, there's confusion because you, you actually do, but you lost it. Or, you know, uh, uh, it, it, something like that, okay? And this is under penalty of perjury. It's just coming back to this intimidation factor. It's a problem. Yes, sir? Has any state implemented uh, the issuing of a voter ID along simultaneously or in conjunction with registration? Or is that something the politician is supposed to avoid? Yeah, all right, so, so this is interesting. Uh, but it's not to vote, it's so interesting. At our hotline, we get calls all the time from people who are, want to know uh, what can they do to get their ID. And as it turns out, what they're talking about is their voter registration ID card. Interestingly, uh, there are states or there are colleges and universities that 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 people need to have. They need to have the number on their voter registration ID card or something. Anyway, we get these calls all the time, and 
And so I just walk people through it. I say, okay, what's your county? What's your state? Okay, now we're going to Google voter, voter register. Okay, here we are. Here's a phone number. Call these people because that's the local person who will be able to give you your, your, uh, your uh, voter registration information. Um, so, uh, uh, no, there's, that, that's as close as it, as it comes to my knowledge. Yes, ma'am. Uh, one additional question is that you mentioned previously legal women voters, um, ACLU, and a lot of organizations that team with churches or you know, people of color and that sort of thing. Can you speak up? Um, yeah. Relative to the League of Women Voters and the ACLU, some of the larger organizations that have some decent funding, has there been any effort from your organization to sort of team with them so that you could maybe pull funds or pull, you know, pull resources or even leverage campaigns? Um, you know, because it does seem challenging, especially all the hard work you're doing, but now you're facing new laws and yet more states. So it feels like to get on top of this, you're going to have to get a, a broader slate of you're, 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 you're preaching to the choir. We, with uh, the National Voter Corps uh, steering committee this afternoon, we were talking about that very um, prospect. Uh, so uh, watch Al this space, Allison <laughs> and and. and uh, and and Patty and uh, a bunch of folks are are going to be trying to to make steps in in that direction. So and you know, would make a lot of sense. I did want to mention for some of us who may not know, many people here are probably extremely well informed. But uh, Chris Kobach, by the way, the gentleman you referenced, I believe he's the secretary. Of yeah, State I mentioned for, him. Yeah. for Kansas, I believe this is his role. He was the one I was indirectly referring to when I said he created massive voter rolls that eliminated yes. anyone with yes. right. No, and he's at first I wasn't <clears throat> sure how serious that effort was. Within days of Trump's election, he was named to Trump's transition team. Yes. Yes. yes, no, I know. So that it, it's it's a big concern. Uh okay. Yes. Well, <clears throat> I that just means this, but all this, all this is very complicated. Um, so, is there an ongoing group here in the local area who uh, brings us together to keep learning about this and keep trying to do something that's effective? So, uh, with that, I am really <laughs> pleased to reintroduce Ms. Smith who's the founder of National Voter Corps and uh, who uh, we are very much looking forward to working closely with uh, everybody up here. So, so watch this space because we're going to give you a very, please take this, right? We're going to give you a short presentation on National Voter Corps and, sorry, can I please? Uh, did everybody, I had left some uh, handouts out there. Did everybody get them or, because I've got some extras. Got, so, Okay, good. Sorry. Here we go. Okay. Okay. So, can you see that? Okay. So, uh, I just want to introduce, there are new slides here. If you've seen it before, stay, because we want you to ask us more questions. Uh, but I need a little help here how to get this into slide mode. Oi. I need a little help here. Here's your tech. Scroll. Yes. Here, scroll down. Yes. Here's my expert. No, it's just, it just looks weird. It's a, it's a PDF. What's on here? Lena? Lena, do you want to come up? Here it is. Or did you guys go? Right, go right. Right, right. One more. One more. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, we want to I want to put a screen and I just this is gonna drive me nuts. I can't stand so like this. <laughs> Lena? The green uh, button on the upper left. Yeah, yeah. Oh Elena, thank you, my dear. Okay, thank you. Welcome. 
Uh, will the steering committee for National Voter Corps put your hands up, please? Because we're, we will be happy to answer questions after, it, after you go through this and you ask us questions at large. Um, who are we? We are a group of people from Silicon Valley who were very upset after the last election. And we broke into different groups and I stood up and said, I want the Peace Corps in America and I want to call it the National Voter Corps and I want every single county, wherever there is voter repression, voter suppression, voter ID laws, any of that nonsense, to have an organization on the ground in every county, in every state, that is going to ensure our vision, which would be a more engaged citizenry with unfettered access to the polls nationwide. Lyndon Johnson summed it up when he said, a man without a vote is a man without protection. He was ageist. You know, we're in a different world now. Now it's not, why can't I get to the next one? Our mission, we want to create a national nonpartisan organization to fight voter restrictions and to work towards 100% voter participation. Now, if a voter doesn't want to vote, there are some religions that say you can't vote, whatever, that is a tragedy, but that's not our problem. At least a person who wants to vote ought to be able to vote, and it needs to be now. Barack Obama said it. There's no such thing as a vote that doesn't matter. Our mission. <laughs> Sorry. I, I don't know why it's not going down. I, this, I'm not technically. Are you using the arrow key? I'm using the arrow key. Okay, so who are we? We've said who we are as a group, but you are all of us. We're all concerned citizens here. And we really want to stop voter discouragement. And what we want is to better, our goal is to better coordinate all of these national and state groups to fight together. So we discovered vote riders through some of the web searches that we're doing. Hence, we've invited Kathleen here. Two weeks ago, we had the leading authority from Stanford University talking about voting machines, voter fraud, and his one conclusion, David Dill, his one conclusion was, you must have a paper ballot and the count must be auditable. And under no circumstances have internet voting. Okay, well, I need somebody else here. Declining voter participation we talked about already, but in fact, if only 58% of the eligible voters vote, who is leading America? Well, mostly, you heard that at least 11% of eligible voters didn't have the appropriate voter ID. What if they had voted? Would it make a difference? 32 states have restricted voter identification laws. Come on. I don't know. I, I'm, I, this is driving me nuts. Voter, I've got it now, I've got a little thing at the bottom that's going to help me. These are the type of voter restriction laws, you may not be aware of this, but physical obstacles to voting. People stood in line for five to six hours. You know that, you saw the pictures. That's an obstacle. Another one is to reduce either early voting, have no early voting, not allow absentee ballots, not allow voting places, Reducing the number of voting spaces places at colleges, universities, in minority districts. That is a racist, that is disenfranchisement. 
of an, a whole class of people. Are you aware that very few states allow felons to vote? And an ex-felon who has served his time is no longer on parole, he or she is not able to vote in some states. In California, they can vote, but many do not realize they can vote. That is disenfranchisement. And does it surprise you that the majority of felons in this country are minorities, whether they be black or Chicano? So this is a disenfranchisement of a whole class of people. If you can't vote by mail, what happens if you're traveling on business? If you can't, if you're ill, but you had to apply for your vote by mail or your, your absentee ballot before you got ill, you are not going to be able to vote. Is that right? Someone here talked about uh, interstate voter uh, registration program, I believe Kansas was one of the examples, a cross-check program. This program is said to have removed millions of voters. I cannot attest to that, but there certainly has been on daily costs articles about this. We talked already today, Kathleen talked about voter intimidation, but electronic voting without a paper trail, where you can't actually see on a paper tape that could go to the registrar's office if anything goes wrong with that voting machine, that your vote before you cast it is actually the vote you cast. So here's a sample of, as my friend Lisa calls it, the map of shame. Green, the green says that you had, um, sorry, I can't, I've, I've covered up the, what green is. Uh, green is a good place to vote. <laughs> Does it surprise you that it, it, um, in some states now, they have the, you can see the red, this is where they are going to be changing or make it even more repressive. Maine, Maine is supposed to be a fairly, a fairly reasonable state. They have legislation right now in the legislature to reduce voting rights. Oh, how do we get there? I don't know how we got there. Okay, so we have a 50 state project. How many of you here are doing research on the 50 state project? You're signed up. So we already, we have 130 people who are part of the National Voter Corps right now. But of that we have given out, Lisa, could you tell us how many states? About 28. 28 states where we are doing basic research, not on what the voting laws are, because you can get that at Vote Rider, but what organizations are on the ground in each of these 30 states whom we could try to feed through our National Voter Corps volunteers to go and help in those states where you need to have voter ID, voter, Vote Rider needs more help where we could feed volunteers, we could get people power from the ACLU, we could get the legal and voters in those states or those specific counties to actually work together. So we want to feed people to where the need is. Um, we are going to look, we're, uh, we're in the forming stage at this point, but we, I am working very hard with the ACLU and the League of Women Voters lobbying at the state and national level to try to get a, an existing 501c3 ACLU foundation with some of the money they've gotten in for voter rights to actually put paid staff in 50 states and then devolve down to the local important counties
to have paid staff there in order to get vote riders out and the other forms of repression overcome so that we actually have what our vision is, which is to have the Peace Corps, the National Voter Corps, actually have Uber, Lyft, I mean, if you know people on the boards of Life, Lyft, what it's called, Life? I don't know, I don't use these groups, but if you know, oh, now, <laughs> if you know anybody that's on those boards of directors, we want to get them to volunteer to have a car or a or a vehicle in every single one of the identified counties that we need to be working with in this country. We have very big ideas, but what we need is a lot of hands. So, thousands of volunteers signing up by January 2018, but we are focused right now on three states because there are elections in 2017, and there's some minor elections also, a few Congress people. Virginia, New Jersey, and there's, a, there's an election in, in Georgia, but that's, we're really too late for Georgia. Other people are working on Georgia. But we want Virginia, we want to test our system, our view of what we could do to support boat riders and other organizations for a test group this summer in those two states and then roll it out to every state that's holding a gubernatorial or senatorial election in 2018. We are a non-partisan organization, but those are the important states because that's where votes will happen. So we're orienting ourselves. Here's our unique contribution. We have a website. We're called nationalvotercorps.org. It's pretty easy to remember us. Sign up, we'll help you. And why another group? We don't want to be another group. What we want is to get the ACLU and the League of Women Voters to join together and do this because they have far more viability and take over the service mark that I have taken out called National Voter Corps. But if we have to do it, we will become a 501c3 and we will do it because we think it's the most important thing that we can do. So let's answer the call, everybody. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Our view is the National Voter Corps should be chaired by the Obamas, the Bushes, the Clintons, and the Bushes. Whoever is living as a past president and his or her wife should be the head of this because democracy is at risk. And the National Voter Corps is proud to be working with vote riders. And we're going to figure out more. We've really, we've only met today, right, Kathleen? But we know that they are the right group to be part of the solution. And we know that people power at the ACLU has 600,000 people. We know the ACLU has 2 million vote people that can work, and they're a nonprofit foundation. I happen to be the chair of MidPen ACLU. I'm not authorized to speak for ACLU, but by God, they're going to speak to me. <laughs> so seriously, are there any questions? We would be happy to fend questions, the right person on the steering committee. We need expertise. We have a wonderful man. Don, are you here? Don has been Don has been doing the the website. Wait till you see our website. We need to put more information up there. Lisa has done a fabulous job with Nirvana on the 50 state solution. Our 50 state solution is to use existing information and make sure that everybody can get hold of it. We need media help. We need your help. We're not asking you for money. We're asking you for brain power and for links to the people you know. Because every single one of you needs to go up when you have a share of stock. And when it says, should you vote your shares to support the minority shareholder suggestion that every single political dollar that that corporation gives 
has to be voted on by the shareholders, as they have to do in most European countries, vote yes. You vote for the minority shareholder positions. It's March. You're getting all those big envelopes in the mail and you throw them away. Well, don't do that. You're an American citizen. You vote your shareholders. And you tell them that, that your vote makes a difference. And it makes a difference at shareholders. It makes a, bit, a difference at the Palo Alto Unified School District or anywhere else you are. And don't you dare let a single Congress place run in a non-contested election because every single American should have a chance to vote for what you stand for. So thank you very much.